flying. The plane could literally be redesigned in flight to suit the role it had to perform. Within the surface of the wing, flaps, slats, and fuel, together with their operating mechanisms, had to work side by side. To enable the forward slats to function, General Dynamics built a glove that also acted as an airfoil. The development of the Air Force F-111A model continued through the early 60s, and good progress was made as the new technology was put through its paces. General Dynamics and the Air Force were both pleased with the progress of their groundbreaking state-of-the-art aircraft. But Grumman, which was developing the Navy's F-111B model, had less success with its prototypes. The Navy was not happy with its new plane. Given Secretary of Defense McNamara's commitment to standardization, the Navy had little choice but to accept the B version of the F-111. But the F-111 prototypes were just too heavy for successful carrier use. Two expensive weight reduction programs failed to reduce the B model's weight by the required 20,000 pounds. Worse, the modification process had radically reduced standardization. The F-111B model was a beautiful aircraft, but it never saw service. In July of 1968, the Navy canceled the F-111B program. Instead, it went ahead with its new dedicated fleet defense fighter, Grumman's F-14 Tomcat. But the F-111A continued testing. The Air Force's Harvest Reaper program was launched to bring the F-111 to combat readiness. By early 1968, after eight months of testing, it was decided that the F-111 should be tried out in actual combat conditions in Vietnam. Six aircraft from the 474th Tactical Fighter Wing were deployed from Nellis Air Force Base to Thailand. The F-111A flew out of the Royal Thai Air Force Base at Tok Lee. The combat testing and evaluation program was called Combat Lancer. The Thai base put the new planes within striking distance of North Vietnam. Unfortunately, the results were not all good. 
Within two weeks, two F-111s were lost without a trace. Less than a month later, another 111 went down. But this time, the crew ejected, and the wreckage was found and examined. The losses caused bad publicity back home and were wrongly attributed in some news reports to ground fire. After 50 missions had been flown, Operation Combat Lancer ended. The three remaining F-111s returned to Nellis for more testing. Afterwards, engineers discovered that the losses in Vietnam were caused by a failure in the plane's massive horizontal stabilizer. Then, in December of 1969, a Nellis-based F-111 lost a wing, resulting in a fatal crash. All F-111s were grounded. The entire program was placed under intense scrutiny. The wing problem was traced to a failure in the wing pivot box. These were hard times for General Dynamics. For the expense of developing the twin designs, considerable cost overruns, and the losses in Vietnam had caused the new fighter bomber to suffer at the hands of the press and political opponents alike. General Dynamics' defense was that the F-111 was a technological trailblazer that incorporated so many new systems that major problems would almost certainly be encountered. Both the Air Force and General Dynamics realized that despite the development problems, the F-111 was a winner, so they began improving the design. Despite the F-111's long evolution, very few external changes are noticeable. One minor one, the deletion of the moving air intake cowl and its replacement by the demand-activated inlet door, distinguishes the early A version from other models. By the time the modification program was completed, the F-111 had become a near-perfect plane. The Tactical Air Command used four different strike versions of the F-111. Externally, they were almost identical, but they varied considerably in cost, depending on the electronics packages used. The F-111 was also adopted by the Strategic Air Command, which needed a replacement for its older B-52s and B-58 Hustlers. SAC's new strategic bomber was dubbed the FB-111. The SAC version had a longer wing and a strengthened landing gear, but otherwise was similar to its cousins in the Tactical Air Command. Today, the F-111, once only designated a fighter, now also flies alongside B-52s as a strategic bomber. It is still probably one of the premier bombing planes in the world, bar none. I mean, there's not many people in the world that can bomb as well as we can, that can go as far as we can, and there is no one in the world that can go as fast as we can near the ground. And we, we cannot run F-16s and F-15s. I think everybody's had a scary moment at one time or, or another in the aircraft. Uh, the one I had <clears throat> that I remember occurred in uh, Turkey when I was training low level in there and we were, uh, had a simulated attack by an F-4. Uh, we were low to the ground, we made a uh, hard turn into the F-4, and I had some uh, computers uh, go out on me, which caused the aircraft to start wavering in the yaw axis. Uh, 200 feet or so and uh, low to the ground and the jet decides to go down is not a fun feeling. In 1972, 
Four years after its first test in combat, the F-111 returned to Vietnam as part of Operation Linebacker. Within 33 hours of leaving home at Nellis Air Force Base, planes were striking targets in Hanoi. This time, the results were very different. Flying alone or in pairs, the planes of TAC's 474th Fighter Wing notched up 4,000 successful sorties in six months. Okay, we're coming up on our entry point in about five miles. We'll be turning right to a heading of 101. Okay, coming right here. I'll go out and back and bypass on the radar altimeter. Put the left channel in TF and we'll put the right channel over to the situation. Okay. Ready to start on down deck? Roger. Okay, on a TF, start down. Okay, I'm picking up the ground returns now. Yeah, attitude indicator looks good. Coming on down the east coast, ground returns coming in, and the radar altimeter clicked in at 5,000. Roger, we should level off about 500. Get down to 1,000 here now, coming up 700, 600, and it's leveling off real fine, 500. Okay, looks good. I've got a ridge coming up at five miles on the scope and it's dead again, going to 5 over 15. Okay. Looks like it's about three miles on my east scope now. Right. Okay, we should be passing in about 10 seconds. Okay, I'm going to target. And we're in target and I'm picking up the up returns. It looks good. Crosshairs are falling good. Got the gun. Okay, we're going to target now. Okay, we're going to target In the whole operation, only six aircraft were lost, giving the F-111 the highest survival ratio of any combat aircraft in the theater. The F-111 returned from Vietnam with its reputation dramatically enhanced, and criticism of the plane became muted. Later support for the wisdom of the swing-wing bomber concept came from the Soviet Union. Their Su-24 Flintser was patterned virtually bolt for bolt on tax fighter bomber. Two major modifications have dramatically increased the F-111's potential. One was devised by Grumman, the company that designed the Navy's F-111 model. Grumman's EF-111 Raven project found yet another use for this versatile airframe. The Raven Project takes early model F-111s, strips them down to basic components, then completely rebuilds them as electronic countermeasures platforms. In the Raven, the second crew member is an electronics weapons operator who uses sophisticated equipment to disrupt enemy radar. This provides a curtain for other attacking aircraft. The Raven can be used in three different ways. First, in a standoff jamming role, providing protection for other aircraft from a distance. Second, as close air support, going in at low level to give ground attack aircraft electronic cover. And finally, the Raven can fly with an attacking force deep into hostile airspace, jamming enemy radar as it goes. This system was used extensively in the Persian Gulf.